We are live. This is a literary roadhouse, one short story once a week. I'm Katie. I'm Gerald. And I'm Anise. And that voice that you heard at the top of the episode belongs to Katie Hageman. Hageman or Hageman? How do you say Hageman? Hageman, Hageman is what I thought. Yep. Uh, she is an author and illustrator from the mountains of North Carolina. Having written for well over a decade for personal enjoyment, two years ago she decided to take her pursuits a step further and publish some of her works. To date, she's released two children's books, Haven't You Heard? and In This Book You Will Find, as well as book one of her new series of novels entitled The Awakening. You may learn more about Katie at her website, katiehageman.wixsite.com. A link is provided in the show notes. Welcome to the show, Katie. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Happy to be yeah. here. Yeah, this is exciting. Also, is that, um, so anyone who's watching this on YouTube see these lovely walls behind Katie. Yeah. Did you paint those? I did. <laughs> <laughs> That's what happens when you have itchy fingers and you run out of canvas and you have ideas that need to go someplace. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah I, they're I, all around me. <laughs> I was looking at some of the art on your website and it was, it's similar in style. So that's why I picked yeah. up on that. Oh, yeah. Okay. yeah. It's kind of like the whimsical, bright, bright colors, facets. Yeah. So you're, were you an illustrator or a writer first? Um, I guess I've been writing. Well, I don't know. I kind of just have done both in tandem just for pleasure. I've just enjoyed doing it. And then, um, a couple of years ago, I have a daughter, she's seven years old and um, she was probably three or four and we read books every night. We just always have, it's our, our habits, part of our nighttime routine. And she um, said that she thought we should make our own book. And I was like, oh, that's cool. Okay, let's do that. What would you want your book to be about? And she had all of these ideas. And um, I just thought that's actually a really good idea for a book is to have a book about all the things books can be about, all the places they can take you, how transportive they can mm -hmm. be. And um, so we worked together and we kind of made this poem about uh, where books can take you. So that's the, uh, in this book you will find, and it, it takes you through like mermaids and pirates and glaciers and um, magical towers and fairies and just all these different places. And then at the end, it, it leaves these uh, couple blank pages and, um, let's kids start their own literary journey. They can, you know, make a picture book or they can write words or they can do both. And it's just supposed to kind of encourage literacy and, and genre exploration at an early age, you know, kind of expose kids to a lot of different ideas. So in that aspect, I did the writing first, I guess. Mm -hmm. And, um, and then we started to make pictures for it and it all just kind of came together. That's really not, that's lovely. Uh, so um, did, you, did you already paint before this though, this, this experience with your daughter or is this something mm -hmm. that you sort of learned for the book? No, I, I had been doing it before. I had mm -hmm. um, I had a really amazing art teacher in high school named Mr. Totten. Mr. Totten and I. And um, he just really um, pressed how individual art was. Like you don't have to measure up to anything. It's just your expression and, and your way. There's really no wrong way to do it, you know? And um, so since then I had been drawing and doing a little painting and things like that. And um, so I'd, I'd been doing it for a little while before and I had done some canvas work and little things, but not not to the extent of, of putting it together in a, in a, a work, like a book. Hmm. So then in this book, you will find was first and then you wrote, haven't you heard? Mm -hmm. Was mm -hmm. that also with your daughter or was that just you sort of uh, investing in children's writing? That was just me kind of investing in children's writing. I had, um, I, it's so strange when you write, cause sometimes it's just nothing really comes to you. And then sometimes you're like, oh my gosh, I could write this entire story right now. And you do. And, <laughs> and that kind of happened to me over one afternoon. I just, this poem came to mind. And um, I wrote it down and then I made the, the images to go with it. Um, but uh, Haven't You Heard is, is about uh, the way that children can engage and see an invisible God through visible qualities through creation. Like it's um, the beginning is um, hush little word, um, hush little one, haven't you heard? Um, and it, he, it's, it's about God inviting you to engage in asking him questions and, um, and looking for him and, um, just the ways that he, 
shows himself and expresses himself. And so that yeah. one, yeah. Yeah, that's that's lovely too. Yeah. Uh, you, you did the illustration for that one as well. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Cool. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so it's not Very just good. you. Yeah. It's not just you and your daughter who are like, um, have literary aspirations. You were also, uh, you shared with me a story by your 14 year old niece that yes. she was old enough to publish online, which I don't have that kind of courage. She is <laughs> amazing. Yeah. yeah. She, um, she's actually at a, a school right now, a high school that, um, focuses a lot on, on arts and she's, just, I mean, she's, I don't know if you got the chance to read that story or not, but it was, I, I had read it and it haunted me for like a week. <laughs> it yeah. just was so good. And, um, it just, I was really proud of her. So she's got, I mean, she's just, she's amazing. She's already a writer. She's just mm -hmm. amazing. So I can't wait to see what she does, but she definitely has, she has my, my writing prowess, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously. Obviously. <laughs> it's like a gritty Hansel and Gretel retelling, right? It is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. She totally does a twist. And I feel like saying it's a twist won't rob the story of anything because it's just, it's really, really good. So yeah. um, um, kudos to her. It kind of ends and you just think, what? <laughs> what just mm -hmm. happened? <laughs> so it's it's really good i'm proud of her yeah well if you're curious and you want to read this gritty hansel and gretel retelling uh, i'm going to provide a link to it in the show notes as well so people can go and and read the awesome. story um you yeah. definitely should because it's really good yeah. <laughs> not biased though um, i'm not biased at all but honestly it's one of those stories i feel like i know i'm biased i love her with all my heart i will always love her but it's like if i had read this on my own outside of knowing her i still would have been like what this is, this is good. I love this. <laughs> so. Yeah. Excellent. Well, go read that story. And um, if you haven't read this, the story that we're discussing this week, you should read that too. So Gerald, um, let's go like this, go into the discussion. And what did we read this week? Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm <falling laughs> <away>. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm doing this summary, aren't I? Uh, <clears throat> Should we edit this bit out, eh? I think so. But not yeah, for YouTube. Maybe. The YouTube people, I think, love this. <laughs> yeah, I think, what's going Behind on? The what sort of amateurs? I know, the crazy people. Um, <clears throat> okay, today's story is about James and Celeste, who seem to have a slightly uneasy relationship. We follow them on a hike up and into a dormant volcano. And then later, they're on a beach where they eat the fruit of an unknown tree and then start to suffer unpleasant side effects. James searches on the internet, finding that the tree was the Manchineel, one of the world's deadliest trees. Although the effects can be more serious, Jackson finished with Celeste vomiting up the fruit, but James retains the, his inside him. And thus, we have a story about myth and reality, apparently. Apparently. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, we both forgot to mention the story at the top, so I'm going to put it here to cut it for the polished audio. So, uh, so, um, so this week we discussed poetry by Greg Jackson. Uh, yeah, right. I'm <laughs> just did he go with yes. Gregory or Greg? <laughs> uh, right, he goes by Greg, not Gregory. Greg, Greg. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Greg. Yes. Okay. So this week we read poetry by Greg Jackson. So Gerald, uh, what happened in the story? And I'm going to cut that with the magic of editing. This is magic, isn't it? I know. <laughs> okay. So um, we always start at just the top level of just, did you like the story? Uh, so it's, our discussions are very much from a reader perspective. So Katie, did you like the story? I did. I thought it was neat. Um, I definitely think it, it's interesting that it's called poetry because there's obviously parts of it that are referring to poetry, but I think it was very poetic itself, like the way he describes certain places and um you know i really like authors who make scenes tangible like that you really feel like you're present for and that you can feel and i, I think he really did that and that that really was uh, a positive for me i liked that a lot mm -hmm. and gerald did you like it yeah I, I i think on the top level um i really enjoyed it he he's he's a very skillful writer obviously um, he's got a great turn of descriptive phase, phrase, 
um, which I really enjoyed. And, and some of his description, some descriptive prose is, is really nice, really beautiful. And the, there is a rhythm to his writing, which, which, is, which is really good. So on, on the top level, um, it's an enjoyable story. Yeah. I like that a lot that when you were talking about the rhythm, it's almost like there's like a, an iambic pentameter to it. Like there's mm -hmm. just, I, I like that too. It yeah. makes it satisfying to read. Mm. Yeah. It's smooth. Yeah. Yeah. I really like the story, but I feel like a bit like uniquely identified with the story. Not uniquely. There's a lot of people who've had my experiences, but I mean, uh, on this podcast, because, um, so as Gerald knows, I, lived in Costa Rica for seven years. So I knew about the Manchineal and a lot of the descriptions that he put in there were true to my experiences. I also like climb volcanoes and that steep descent into the crater is exactly as he described, actually more agonizing. Um, <laughs> you know, just things like Celeste that. Celeste so like, knew. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So it just felt like, um, like, yes, this is what it's like. I mean, he's not in Costa Rica in the story. He's on a uh, volcanic island, and Costa Rica's on an island. Um, but there's a lot of volcanoes. And, uh, yeah, um, so I love that part of it. And also, there was this part about where they're talking about, I think Celeste is arguing with James about not making decisions out of fear. And that's been, like, one of my guiding principles since high school. And whenever I've had the courage to act on my own convictions, I've never regretted those decisions, the more courageous ones in my life. Um, so I really love that. Like, I was just like, yes, someone sees me. Yay. Mm -hmm. uh, that's always fun when a story does that. Yeah, I thought that was um, – in. in <laughs> That was such a complex part of the story for me because I I agree, you know, you want to be that that brave person who, you know, goes out to the end of the limb where the fruit is kind of thing. And um, <laughs> but there's it's interesting from Celeste's point of view, because his James is striving for obtaining that freedom, like his focus on wanting to live life to the max was almost his prison. Like it was, I think she was trying to make the point to him, uh, to him that it wasn't so much about doing things. It was about being present for things and enjoying things. And she felt like he was robbed of that and was trying to get him to see that. I think a lot of the time, because he was so focused on getting things done and putting that, you know, just building adventures rather than experiences. That makes mm. sense. Really? It's funny because I had a slightly different read where I think for him it was you need to experience it to actually know it. Like there's a bit mm -hmm. of a, like he feels like you haven't lived because there's that aspect where it's what you learn like at a distance, secondhand, right? Like, um, right, for sure. Yeah, and 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 uh, Gerald and I read an interview by him where he sort of reinforces that point, but it's in the story as well when he's like looking up like what the Death Apple does, mm -hmm. um, and there's all these horrifying things that he's reading and a lot of misinformation in there too, um, and he decides like he needs to like experience it in a way. Like even that mm -hmm. decision is about the learning that happens from experiences versus mm -hmm. the secondhand learning. Um, yeah which I liked a lot too, because I feel like that is also true, right? Like, yeah. um, it's like that thought experiment where it's like, if you have someone who's colorblind and mm -hmm. they know everything about the color red and how the color red is formed and everything, but they've never seen the color red, do they know as much as somebody who's seen it? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's like that. It's like the difference between the experience and the and the sort of like book learning. Mm -hmm. um, but, but she is right that he, it does come like, from a place of, of fear of death. Yeah, like is it is that because that's what drove him to that or because he was like, hey, I love life and I want to live it? It was like a balance. And I think, and another, you know, I think it was just, it was also from a relationship standpoint, it was curious to see how much it spoke to that side of things because there was so much they lacked in communication. Mm -hmm. And I mean, even when he's having that imaginary argument with her in his head, it ends with, why don't you actually talk to me? <laughs> and it's like, they could have, like what we're discussing now, but you know, where maybe I would be coming from Celeste's viewpoint, but you're coming from, from James's, they could have understood more, but there's that, also that fear of discussion, I guess that vulnerability. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's funny that you bring up the relationship because you know, there were some pretty stark differences, but also some similarities, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, Gerald, what do you make of their relationship and um, their compatibility and their differences? 
yeah, it, it's it's kind of funny because <clears throat> at, at the surface level, you think it, it, it could be dysfunctional because they don't seem to discuss things together. They don't, you know, when she, when she slips and she hurts herself, he, he just says, are you okay? And, but he knows that if he goes further, mm -hmm. then he's just going to annoy her. So, so it's this sort of thing where, where they're obviously in, in, in a sort of fairly stable relationship, uh, long term, I would guess, but, it's it it's just it just sort of comes across to me as as being awkward, and yet comfortable mm -hmm. at the same time because they they know each other pretty well and and they know um, when to say things and when not to say things. Mm. Yeah, but in a way they were well suited too. Um, he makes up a myth about a volcano; mm -hmm. she runs with it. Right. Yeah. She keeps referring back to it as if that is now the fact of the volcano, knowing, you know, that it's his myth. They both yeah. enjoy making fun of Jacqueline's or Jacqueline's mm -hmm. uh, poetry, which was mm -hmm. fun. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. They had that banter for sure. That was that was born of um, them being comfortable with each other for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about Jacqueline's poetry. Um, <laughs> I <Yeah>. love her. <laughs> yeah, I like, didn't really get to see her that much, but how much she spoke to me. Like, there's so much you want to be able to put into words, and that you want to express, and you're trying to put your heart in it, and it's just like a, <laughs> it just kind of yeah. falls short, or it doesn't match what your heart's intending. And I just, I like her. Yeah, it it is quite funny because we we had a recent podcast where we had. Um, a sort of comedic character, which which provided a great foil to the sort of seriousness of the main story, and and it really worked well. And it's a bit like this as well. So when they are, they seem quite introspective and and, and quite wrapped up in themselves as individuals. Mm -hmm. They come together through Jacqueline's poetry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you're talking about. Um, is it Susanna in? Um in same bus driver was that the one you're talking about the the that's... the natural life coach yes 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 so if anyone hasn't listened okay. to that episode and you want to learn what he's talking about like yeah it's Susanna or savannah Susanna, one of those names um, real fast, nobody will know yeah. <laughs> it's um <laughs> yeah and and you know one of the, and from just like a writing craft perspective it's really clever to bring in uh jacqueline's poetry because the story is so introspective and so internal mm -hmm. that there was a point in the story where I thought to myself, this isn't a story though. Like nothing's happening. It's right? a thought and process. Yeah. It's just, yeah. It starts heavily with this thought process. And then all of a sudden up, oh, he gets a text and now things are happening. Like, okay. Mm -hmm. So it, it reminds you there's an external world to this very internal character. And speaking of part of the external characters, Hugo, mm -hmm. go <laughs> <laughs> and go. What are your thoughts on Hugo? I think, okay, so again, because I'm cheating, well, not cheating, I read the interview by Greg Jackson and he mm -hmm. he emphasizes, okay, the, here's a wonderful thing about Greg Jackson in the interview. You know how a lot of authors are like, what's the story about? And they're like, I don't know, it's open to interpretation. I just wrote what's in my heart. He's not one of those. He tells you, <laughs> he tells you like at length with multiple sub clauses, exactly what he was thinking when he wrote it. So That's good though. He knows where he's going. Yeah. So he, he emphasized how the story, he says partly, but I, I think of, you know, maybe half it's about um, myth, the way that like experiences sort of just happen. And only in retrospect, do we create myths around them? And we do this in mm -hmm. our own lives. Like, is there that family mm -hmm. vacation that everyone talks about that time that that thing that happened on the cruise and it becomes mm -hmm. like, like a family myth, Legend. right? Yeah. Yeah. So then having yeah. already read that, when I reread the, the story, he's already starting to mythologize Hugo a little bit, right? Yeah. He does nothing about Hugo and he's right. creating a whole internal world for Hugo yes. from the outside. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, so what are we supposed to believe? What, who is Hugo? Like, <laughs> by the end, I wanted to know more about him. Like, what was his story? What's really going on with him? Cause you kind of get this, nef not nefarious, like he's not villainous or anything, but like, there's just something amiss and you wonder what's plaguing his heart and his thoughts and, you know, those long walks in the dark, staring up at a ceiling. And I mean, just what, mm -hmm. who is Hugo? We mm. want to know. I, 
I, I love that. I, I love that the, the fact he, he ends the story with Hugo and says, Yeah. Hugo lay awake in his boyhood bed, giant Hugo staring at the ceiling and dreaming of gardens and fury and freedom. He yeah. doesn't know that, but, he, know. but, it's, it's, but it's, it's great. You know, it's really good good to create mm -hmm. this sort of, it's, it's a mythical character, isn't it? it it's, mm -hmm. you know, all they know, they, they have no interaction with him other than seeing mm -hmm. him. Um, but he's inventing all this story to to, mm. to to back up what he thinks about Hugo. Mm. And even reading how you were saying that he kind of he he fantasizes about him, uh, like makes up his own his own myth about him. I was doing that, reading about his myth of him. <laughs> like in my mind, I'm I'm picturing who Hugo is. I I'm getting a beat on his personality and his mentality. I'm like, no, I'm not. I'm like reading from James's guess of him and. But it's so in that aspect, I mean, knowing what you said about his interview and how he was talking about the creation of myths and, and what leads to that, I think he definitely hit the nail on the head with it because I was doing it in reaction involuntarily yes. to to his writing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and there's even a way in which Hugo, remember, they're like they're walking towards the house and Hugo's walking away. And then when they're walking yes. away, Hugo's walking towards. So even just yes. Hugo's oh, movement. Yeah. Yeah, Hugo's <laughs> movements become like this sort of like magical, like uh, timekeeping, like for yes. their story, it did. for their own myth. Yeah, it kind of helped you with the pace of where they were in the time of day, and mm -hmm. you know, from their arrival to the depart. You know, because it does. You know, when he talks about their arrival, it was Hugo who met them, and then the story wraps up with Hugo. It's yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And you know, uh, I like that whole idea of the way that things become sort of mythological, mm -hmm. um, especially so my store, my family and my boyfriend's family, I feel like have perfected this. Like we're I, I feel like more than half of our family dialogue is referencing these myths that have <laughs> happened. Right. <laughs> like, you know, and I'm sure a lot of families do this. Um, but then in this one, it's such an extreme version of that. Like in mm -hmm. this one, he is trying so hard for some sort of um, greater, more divine experience mm -hmm. that it really puts them in harm's way. Mm -hmm. But they survive. And for having survived, they know more about that tree and its effects than the people on the message boards talking about it, right? Like, mm -hmm. there, there's this sense in which, like, didn't they get it? Didn't they get exactly what they wanted? They he did, yeah. Yeah. I guess, you know, in a sense, you know, he was he was looking for that and a, sort of like an unattainable adventure and story and something to, you know, mm -hmm. rehash on. You know, remember the time we ate that poisonous fruit? And, and that was another thing, too, when he um, when they did that and he first read. I was like, oh, my gosh, they're going to die. Like, <laughs> they're mm. going to eat this fruit. And that's how the story is going to end. They're going to be on their deathbed. But um, it was. What was your take on how he wanted to protect Celeste, how he didn't want her last moments to be anything but as enjoyable as he could manage, even though she was poisoned? Like he didn't want her to have the anxiety of knowing she was poisoned. Like it was almost kind of him sucking her into his, um, I don't want to say ignorance is bliss because that's not it, but like, um, he made a decision you know, for her, and that's it. Bothered yes, me. yes, yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. There was mm -hmm. that, but then it's like if you knew there was nothing you could do about it, and you knew, and, and yeah, I don't know. That's yeah, just... and I think that also there's a, there's a self preservation about it as well, yes. because it was uh -huh. his idea to eat the fruit. Mm -hmm. There was so a if, guilt. If he said, "Oh, this is pretty dangerous stuff," you know, we might be really ill because of it. You know, maybe he he worries that that she would be angry with him. So, so I think. And and I can relate to that actually. That you, yeah. you you sort of don't say anything; you just see how it goes. And and yeah. <laughs> and well, see that again is right. fear driving his mm -hmm. decision making instead of them. You know, maybe if he had told her that, "Hey, I just read this. This is where we are," and they had a moment to take that in. You know, maybe they could have had the talk that he imagined them having before. Maybe they could have gotten mm -hmm. to a different place. Maybe they could have. You know, instead of just hallucinating on the beach, regurgitating poisonous fruit, you know, it could have been a been a turning point for things. Yeah, yeah. I yeah, I, I 
my strongest emotional reaction was him making the decision for her. I'm like, no, 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 no. Like, even if He's I wish, yeah. I know, like, I, I wish that if I ever found myself in that situation, which that's not the wish, but if I am already there, <laughs> my wish is that um, I would have the uh, emotional maturity, courage, and uh, like, you know, peace of mind to say, you know what, I can't do anything. Let me just have some beers and sit on the beach. Like, Mm -hmm. I wish that, but I would want to be in charge of that decision. If someone made the decision mm -hmm. for me, I'd be so mad. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Because it yeah. really was, you know, for, for him to be so focused on getting stuff done before dying, you mm -hmm. know, he kind of, if he knew her timeline, he robbed her mm -hmm. of, of getting to decide what to do with the rest of hers. So yeah, mm -hmm. I, I see that. I see that. Yeah. But they survived. Um, they survived. survived. I know. I actually read the end twice. I was like, they really survived, right? Like, this isn't, yeah. you know. <laughs> mm -hmm. And you know, it also, like, side note, just like, I like how these are two extremely intelligent people who are just like, yeah, this seems close enough to some prune I learned about. I'm just going to eat it. Like, mm. <laughs> I know. Like, what? We're in a foreign country. Who does I that? I know. And having been in those jungles, like, everyone tells you, don't put anything, in, don't even touch some of these things. There's this, there's this uh, plant that colloquially is known as monkey's tail because it, like, curls and looks furry. Don't touch it. You can't mm -hmm. even touch half the plants while you're hiking. Like, mm -hmm. you know. Ugh. <laughs> Who just yeah. puts things in their mouth? <laughs> <laughs> James does. And then he gives it to us a lot. And I was thinking too, at the end, um, you know, you were you just read the the last bit of it when he was talking about how the the fruit was still sitting inside of him. I thought that was very um profound and metaphoric of how, you know, the that poison is still in him, but she's been free of it. Mm. Yeah. Oh, that was interesting. Yeah, I think mm -hmm. so. I think that's that that's that that was very specific that that that, mm -hmm. um, that she has she has got rid of it and, and she doesn't have that and he, and he it's almost like he's quite quite proud that he's retained it. Mm -hmm. It's it's um yeah. Strange. Yeah. It is quite strange. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But in a way, I there's a lot of parallels between James's striving for that. Uh, higher experience and um, Jacqueline's uh, writing and trying to get a higher experience through poetry because they're both trying to experience something, both kind of failing at it a little bit because you almost got, in James's case, he almost got him and his girlfriend killed. And in Jacqueline's case, which this was just a stroke of genius, was having the poetry come through in texts that often have <laughs> autocorrect mistakes. Yeah. It's just like, like perfect. Like, oh, mm -hmm. well done, Greg Jackson. Thank you. Like, that was great. Yeah. Um, that was really smart. Again, again, it shows it shows myth and reality, doesn't it? That, that mm -hmm. she's she knows the reality. Jacqueline knows the re reality. But then the myth comes out different. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And in a way, like she still does get though the experience of writing the poetry and feeling like she's connecting with someone, even if there's like some like fails along the way. And mm -hmm. James does get that experience of like doing that hike and like, you know, pushing through the mist, even if like they almost died. Like there's this sense of like, uh, in both cases, how in that striving, there's a lot of missteps. There's like potholes mm -hmm. along the way that you're tripping over. Um, but you still experienced it. You still got mm -hmm. it, right? Like Jacqueline's happy. She's mm -hmm. She clearly loves doing this because she is sending multiple texts. <laughs> <laughs> it's not stopping her. Yeah, she loves this. So what yeah. do you think Celeste how would she have grown from from this experience if you like had to guess if we got to read like the next couple years of their life what do you think do you think this experience would have would have changed her do you think it would have changed them what do you think hmm. oh. i think that might be not like a shortcoming but like a, a place of emphasis the story didn't quite put so much mm -hmm. or at least i can't read it like i think it's very much, it's close to James. It's very much about James. Um, and yeah, cause like Celeste isn't even really, she's there as a way for James to continue pontificating, right? <laughs> she's yes. Like, yeah. yeah. She's, she's yeah. not as dimensional as he is. Like we don't, right. we know she's involved in work. We know she doesn't enjoy all of his shenanigans. She was poisoned. 
they don't mm-hmm. have good communication skills. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there yeah. you go. <laughs> yeah, I think, I, I think you're right. I, th- I think she she was the, she was really just a foil for his thoughts and his actions and his emotions, um, and she was pretty sort of one dimensional. And and do you just think if you if you look forward into the future, it's a pretty bleak future for her. I mean, he he recognizes that she probably looked up for herself about the the beach plum, um, so she probably knows that he didn't tell her for a reason. So you, you sort of think, are you going to stick with this guy? Because because he's mm-hmm. you know he he because he looks it up, but then told her a lie. So it's not just a case mm-hmm. of oh no, I didn't do that. He he mm-hmm. he told her like we're just gonna we're gonna be fine, and so so she now knows he lied. Is you know what sort of future has she got with with this guy who has to keep on doing things and experiencing things, um, and and yet she's a, she's only going up there to try and show that that they can share some of life experiences mm-hmm. because it he says right at the start that he he climbed up a, a volcano or a a mountain before and and right. she stayed, stayed down in camp or something so um and so she's trying to go with him and and try and experience these these things with him and he's 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 probably i i don't think he's a very nice man to be honest <laughs> do you think in that when he that that goes kind of in tandem with the um them ingesting the fruit and him holding on to it, but her purging herself of it. Like she went through the experience with them, but she's decided to let go of it and move on. I mean, I'm really kind of taking No, but I like where you're going. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like maybe it was metaphoric to her going through it with them. She was by his side. She ate the fruit. She went through the ailments that got through it, but she's let go of it. And Mm -hmm but he's still keeping that poison. He's going to still let that fear of, of death of the end drive his decisions into like, I mean, I know you said that's not what his take was on it at the end, but, um, or the author's um, meaning for it, but you know, of her release and him hanging on. Yeah. Or is he hanging on to, um, to the, the myth more than she is. Yeah. Yeah. I like that better. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah. I think one, one of the things that I like in, in talking and speculating about it was um, he actually said something. I saved it here. He says, and for a fleeting second, I saw the way you sometimes glimpse an elusive logic. You have not yet wrestled into captivity. What Celeste meant and how the enemy of all the things I loved, all the lovable things was the fear that kept us from being free. I like the way that he in the beginning described that the glimpse of elusive logic. Cause I feel that way about reading his whole story. Like you, you kind of think you get it or you get this little glimmer of understanding and then it's gone again. Like you get so close and it slips away. But, mm. <laughs> but I, I really liked how he, how he described things like that for better or worse i thought he did a good job yeah yeah i I love the way that he described things as well um and there is an elusive quality but i think it's um it's a bit intentional because Mm -hmm. the yeah it's that difference between the myth and the reality and if you don't know exactly where the line is then how can you draw a very firm conclusion about Mm -hmm. the lesson other than the lesson is that that line is a bit blurred mm-hmm. um and maybe the blurring of that line it's you know it's um it's very human like we've been doing that since the dawn of civilization and this is sort of like the biggest takeaway that i take from the story it's here's this striving jacqueline's doing it um james is doing it celeste must be doing it on some level we're just not in her world we see hugo from the outside doing it he's staring off into distances all the time something's happening there um and in that striving, we create these narratives about uh, the way that, that things should be or the way that things should be experienced. Um, and we, we make up stories along the way that, um, yeah, I like that. He, in, the, in the interview, he asks a question, which is, why does anyone write poetry? 
And he's not asking that in a sassy way, like who I burn poetry. I think he's asking that in a genuine way of like, why is that a thing that people do? Like, why? Yeah, where like, does think that come about from? it. What, yeah. what spurs that? You know, yeah. it's it's wanting to be felt. And like you were saying, you know, it made you feel heard and understood. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, yeah. yeah. And that's that's why you do it. You know, you want to be able to express those, you know, those, those deep seated emotions and thoughts and have people say, oh, yeah, I'm mm -hmm. not alone. Or, yeah, or. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. that's because I think right at the end, he, he's, I mean, he's, he's hinting at, at sort of myths all the way through. And so when he said, um, when he said the apple is it, right at the end, the apple isn't still inside me, but maybe this is a fanciful way of looking at things. I've mm -hmm. not died yet at mm -hmm. any rate into judgment, so I'm broken streak of not dying i will live forever but that's fanciful too so yeah. i think he's about creating his own myths mm -hmm. and to do that he has to experience as many things as possible and then and so that the myth can be created yeah mm. and 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 adding to what you're saying and takes to the next level which is you know yes he says the apple will be inside me forever that is a myth that we know is not true because he is going to poop it out right there's a reality <laughs> here that is not going to change right, right. Exactly. Yeah, it's that yeah. fanciful mindset of his where he wants to he wants to be a myth. Like mm -hmm. he wants to be a he wants to leave behind stories. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I can see how that would get old from Celeste's point of view. Yeah. Like even if you're constantly thinking about that. In the in the interview, the interviewer asks the author if he thinks uh, Celestia James will be happy will, will be a long lasting happy relationship, and he pretty much says yes, which I think is almost kind of, it's kind of funny because like I don't see it, <laughs> but uh, I'm happy you do. Uh, um, yeah, yeah. So yeah. he must know something. You know, maybe on the plane ride home, he was like, "So you Googled it, huh?" And she was like, "Yep." And they talked about it, and it was a turning I point. Mean, <laughs> yeah. Like, I don't, don't see it. There was also, like, a thinly veiled, like, contempt for Celeste's preferred vacation style and her, like, the yeah. her, like, busy work um, ethic. That I don't know if that was intentional or not, but it came through. Like, oh, she's oh, got, yeah. like, yeah, her phone's I blowing up. And she's getting all these emails. She just wants to be, like, at the resort on the beach chilling. And it's like, mm. eh, maybe well, date someone who wants to hike. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You still they exist. Up, man. Yeah. Yeah. That's funny. Yeah. Yeah. yeah the got that vibe of... for Celeste. I'm glad you picked it up too. I was like, what oh, yeah. Mean? No, I read that. There, there's little red flags everywhere. We're just like, mm. you don't like really I... like Celeste. You just want to win over Celeste. Like, you, like it's, it's almost like you want Celeste to agree with you. That's the win. Yeah. You want yeah. her to, to be a part of you. He loves her in the sense where he wants her to be a part of his myth, mm -hmm. but she's a part of reality. And if he wants to share in her reality, he might have to take a step away from himself. And, yeah. Yeah. Gerald, did you pick up on a bit of contempt for? Yeah. Yeah. I was just looking at the, the bit where, where he's, he said, I just received another message from Jacqueline, a third that day. It's almost like he's, that, that Celeste has her own life, her own work and, mm -hmm. and her own conversations. Yeah. And it's almost as if he's trying to say, Look, I get messages too. He, he, I, he's, I felt that way too. Yeah, I wonder where he, he sort of feels threatened by her. You know, he's he's driving. It sounds like he's driving the relationship by by basically saying he wants to do these things and he's going to do these things. And if she wants to work at the relationship, then she has to come and do them together mm -hmm. with him. Um, and I think he feels threatened by by the fact that she does have her own things going on that are outside mm -hmm. of his control. So maybe he's a bit, a bit control freaky as well. Mm -hmm. We don't yeah. like this guy. I mean, <laughs> we don't know this guy, he says. <laughs> he says we don't like this guy. Yeah. Oh, oh, like oh, 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 oh. <laughs> Either way. <laughs> yeah. I don't, I, yeah. I didn't read it so much as threatened, but I can see that reading of it. But it was mm -hmm. the line where it was, um, Sometimes it's as simple as telling Celeste to imagine the beach, imagine the heat and the sun, imagine the sun setting over the water, pina coladas, our last light, our light on the bay, dinner, anything she likes, right? Like, just like, you know what I mean? Like, there's just this weird sort of, yeah. 
He was yeah. weaving his own a, a myth to suit her to pacify her. So that's not he a myth. I think it's just like here's your own. like basic vacation style. Like yeah. you know, like there's but just he like did that. that to appease her. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, mm -hmm. like this is this is what your story would be. Like, here's remember this kind of stuff while we go and do what I'm wanting to do. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think he's trying, yeah, he is saying it there to soothe her because he's put mm -hmm. her in a situation where he knows she's not mm -hmm. happy. But um, but yeah, mm -hmm. it's like like he is he does love her, but I feel like he should love someone who's more like himself because he's not budging mm -hmm. on his wants and um yeah she doesn't like yeah that. he in, in this sort of phone text messagey thing he said Celeste was too busy with her own messages to give me what I wanted which was to make fun of Jacqueline's shy admission <laughs> mm -hmm. Celeste had work it's just the way he writes it Celeste mm -hmm. had work emails flooding in so mm -hmm. so Celeste has got all this stuff going on. Her assistant had taken the entire fall off with a mysterious, even suspect leg injury. You know, he's mm -hmm. he's just making this stuff up and putting on my partner all this stuff. You know, emailed her fifteen times a day, demanding peremptory and vaguely hostile tones that Celeste fill out paperwork. So he's he's. I think he's quite jealous. I think he feels quite threatened by by Celeste's work and by her interaction with with the other people and she's not there to give him what he wants which was mm -hmm. you know to make fun of this particular message mm -hmm. and I think on a broader scale too that speaks of um his irritation at how even though they are on vacation right that, that's what I'm talking working, about and mm -hmm. he's like let's let's be in the myth or let's mm -hmm. at least, I mean, we don't even have to be in my fantasy world. We could at least just be present on the beach doing what you like doing, which we're at mm -hmm. right now. You know, that's what she wants to do. And then they finally do it. And she's not even mentally and emotionally present for it. Mm -hmm. I can understand the frustration that, yeah, they need to talk. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. There's a lot, there's a lot here. That's, mm -hmm. that's, that's, that's there's a lot to work out. Yeah. 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 So, and is there anything else that we want to say, or um, are we good to rate? I'm just looking at the time, so that's why I'm like, we got to get the game. Oh, no, you're good. No, you're yeah, fine. Yeah. Yeah. I just really liked the poetic aspect of it. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I just really liked the whole style of the thing, and it was very thought-provoking. And, I mean, it's one of those things that you just kind of find yourself drifting back to and thinking about, like, oh, yeah. well, I wonder what that meant, or... Yeah. Those are always, those are good. Those are good mm -hmm. stories. Yeah. Well, the descriptions were lovely. Very. Mm. I loved that. Yeah. So we rate on a scale of one to six. So it's really kind of like a one to five with a six for things that make you want to scream. Like that's what's kind of become uh, <laughs> <laughs> like over time, at least for myself. I was like, that was a good story, but I'm not screaming mm -hmm. from the hilltops. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. So um, who wants to rate it first? Who has the number in mind? I, yeah, this, this is really difficult for me. I'm going to rate it as, I'm going to rate it as five because I think, because I like, we, we talk on the podcast about, uh, about an iceberg with a, you know, the sort of the in your face story on the top, but the mm -hmm. subtext underneath. Mm -hmm. And for me, I found the subtext a bit too deep. And, and I know for other people, it would be sort of fairly straightforward. But me, I, I, I like to have a better connection with the subtext than, than this. You know, maybe I'm just a bit simple. So, so, so for me, I found it a bit too deep. Um, but I loved his writing. So five for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm also a five. I didn't – I like the, the depth there um, and the writing style. I, yeah, I think it's a good story, especially for somebody who's like – who's a writer who's trying to craft something like this that's very like heady like how do you make it heady but still have some kind of plot because it's very easy for my fear in the beginning of the story to become true like oh my god this is just someone's internal thoughts <laughs> you know and nothing's gonna happen but then things happen like it was very clever to have the the poison fruit come through and have that decision and have the text like there was a lot of there was just enough plot happening to keep the story moving um which you know, this very easily could have just become a philosophical think piece. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Philosophical think yeah. piece. So, so a five. Yeah. I think I'm right there too. I think like a four and a half to a five. And I'm, just because it was so, 
I just think it was beautifully written. I mean, I've said that mm-hmm. before, like between the, the, the pacing and the, and the description. And I like what you said before about how there's the, the iceberg of it. How you, There's the initial reading and then there's everything that's under it. And if a piece can mm-hmm. keep you, yeah, I'll make it a five. Cause if there's mm-hmm. stuff that can keep you talking and thinking and thinking about what comes after, you know, that's, that's solid. You know, I, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Cool. Yeah, I've had a good discussion about it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe I'll also link to the interview with Greg Jackson. So if you're like trying to figure out everything about the story, he tells you everything. I didn't. I didn't just want to read the interview on air, but honestly, that's the best way to know what the story is about. Um, He just tells. Unless you want to make your myth. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Don't and read it and believe. Oh yeah, you can always reject an author's interpretation of their own work. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. What are they going to do to stop you, though? Really? Exactly. Like, we can't yeah. do anything. Yeah. I mean, we already rejected his idea that this couple's going to make it. Oh, so. yes. <laughs> it's not happening. We don't agree. Yeah. We may not yeah. have realized it yet, but that's not that's not happening. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So it's time to choose next week's story. What are you guys submitting? Uh, Katie? Uh, uh- Oh, I'm going. Right, yeah. Um, I'm gonna submit Paul Blake's uh, short story. It's called "Gang Aft Agley." Okay. Mm. Gerald. And I'm going to Australia for April Ayres Lawson and three friends in a hammock. Awesome. Okay, so I came up with uh, a game that's not trivia or true or false. Another one of my quick and dirty but weird games. So yeah. it's kind of gonna be like hot potato. So, yeah, mm-hmm. so what we're going to play is um, in July of 1995 on the Caribbean island of Montserrat, uh, the Soufriere Hills volcano, which had been dormant for centuries, erupted. It buried the capital of Plymouth under like uh, 12 meters of mud. It destroyed the airport, the docking facility. It was just total devastation. They did, they did evacuate people in time. Um, that, they did or didn't? They did. They did. Okay. Yeah. It was like over the course of months and like the first okay. few eruptions, like didn't bury everyone immediately. Um, but here's what we're gonna play. So we're going to, you guys are gonna guess the first date in July, but you actually don't want to get the number right because when you get the number right, that means the volcano erupted and you're dead. So <laughs> it's like hot potato. You don't want to be holding the potato when the buzzer goes off. Okay. Oh, wow. Okay. So it's a date in July and whoever gets the date right, the buzzer went off. You're holding the hot potato. The volcano erupted, and you died. <laughs> okay. Cool. Do we have to go in sequential order or anything, or can we just no random? It? You definitely don't want to go in okay. sequential order. Yeah. Okay. Thirteen. Yeah. When do we start? <laughs> yes. No. Thirteen. You're still alive. Three. Nope. You're still alive. Uh, second. Still alive. Eighteen. You're dead. <laughs> the volcano erupted. <laughs> You had so many numbers to choose from. No. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm excited for you to. Great. Great. To, I'm so sorry. <laughs> that was fun. Good. Yeah. Difference. I'm excited for you to, to read public story. He actually just came out with a short story collection. I, it released. Uh, the day before yesterday, called a few hours after this, where he is, but this one isn't in that collection, but it's it's online. So, Excellent. awesome, great. So, uh, can you say the name one more time? So, what's the title? Paul it's- Blank. Paul Paul Blake is the author, and it's Gang Aft Agley. It's A uh, uh, dash G L E Y. Great. Like, Agley. Also, yeah, great. So I forgot to write the outro in advance because I was like doing so much prep for the story. So I'm going to do it on the fly. I've done this before. Let's see if I can pull it off. All right. So before you go, let us know which volcanoes you've climbed in our Facebook group, Literary Roadhouse Readers, or on Twitter at Lit Roadhouse or our website, literaryroadhouse.com. Wish you could spend more time with a couple that's definitely going to get either broken up or divorced, hopefully before they have kids. Of course you do. Join the Literary Roadhouse Book Club where we discuss a novel each month. And lastly, we want to travel to the Caribbean to definitely eat these death apples uh, to have our own mythological experience. Support our brush with death and our podcast expenses at patreon.com slash literary roadhouse. Every bit helps. And as always, share this with the Airbnb host texting you poetry. Until next time, read a good story. Did it on the fly. Yay! Good outro. Well done.